Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, all participants around the world. Um, we should begin. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the second session of our IISD webinar series on investment law and policy. So my name is Martin Brau. I'm an international law advisor at IISD, and I will be moderating today's session. Just a quick agenda before we begin. So I'll be doing the moderation today for us. And uh, our three participants, our three experts today will be uh, Zhou Zhang, my colleague based in the Geneva office. He will be presenting to us a background and an introduction to the topic uh, entitled Global Governance on Investment, Historic Overview and Recent Developments. Then Joe will be followed by Lauge Polson, uh, who will be presenting on a business view on investment facilitation. And then Michel uh, San Sanchez Badin will be uh, presenting on investment facilitation, what, why, uh, where, and who. Sorry, there's a, a missing who there. Uh, and then after the extra presentations, we will be uh, doing a question and answer session where you will have an opportunity to, to contribute to the discussion, uh, ask questions to the participants, um, to the experts, I'm sorry. So our experts today, um, just to give you a, a bit of background who they are. So Joe is my colleague based in the Geneva office, also with the International Institute for Sustainable Development, a law advisor there. Lauge Polson is a senior lecturer, lecturer in international political economy. He's also the director of graduate studies in political science at the University College London. And Michel Sanchez Badin is associate professor as well as coordinator of the Center on Global Law at uh, Getulio Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo School of um, the, the Getulio Vargas Foundation, Sao Paulo School of Law in Brazil, in Sao Paulo City. So without much ado, I'll uh, just give the floor now to, um, to my colleague, Joe, who will do his presentation. Uh. Well, people say that uh, history often repeats itself. So if we can find some patterns um, in the history, then this will help guide us through the steps ahead. So therefore, um, before going into the details of today's narrow topic, which is investment facilitation, I would uh, first like to take a look at the evolution of um, the broader global um, global uh, investment governance. So hopefully this will um, help us better frame the issue of today's discussion. And then the participants can also better understand the background of what my distinguished co-panelists will present in a few minutes. So um, as the current global economic order was built from scratch after World War II, so let's start from there. I know it's a long way back, um, but bear with me, I'll just spend a minute here. Um, since the end of the war, there has been at least four attempts um, to multilateralize the investment disputes. Um, I'm sorry, the, the, the multilateral investment discussions. Um, in the 1940s, uh, the negotiation of Havana Charter to establish an international trade organization, which was designed to be, at that time, a regulatory body overseeing global trade, investment, and economic development. Um, so that was the first attempt. And then um, in the 1980s, so you can see here in the chart that uh, the negotiation of the set of agreements that eventually led into the World Trade Organization. Um, during that time, there was a discussion whether to include investment um, or to cover investment issues there as well. And then in the 90s, um, there's OECD led initiative to negotiate a multilateral agreement on investment. And when that process um, didn't work, another round of attempts to introduce the investment into the WTO um, was uh, 
uh, taking place at the end of 90s um, and up to 2000s, early 2000s. So at each of those four junctures, um, there were always a clash of positions. A group of countries would always argue for more liberalization and unrestricted market access. On the other side, there were always countries defending their regulatory autonomy to fulfill their own development needs. Fortunately, up until now, the developing countries have been able to defend their positions at these multilateral negotiations. So what we have today, at the multilateral level, uh, we have WTO as the main regulatory body on economic development, but it only has a very limited coverage on those investment issues. Um, those are mostly covered under the GATS, the General Agreements on Trade and Services, um, the TRIMS, the Agreement on Trade-Related Investment Measures, um, and, and maybe some in the TRIPS, the, the, the trade related intellectual property rights also cover some of the investment measures and activities. Um, but, but that's about it. So um, when, we, when we look at the um, bilateral and regional level, we see that um, we see that um, um, a very different picture there. There's a network of over 3,000 bits and investment chapters um, in FTA, and those um, this network has become the primary source of law governing cross-border investments. Unfortunately, these bilateral um, and regional treaties are highly fragmented and incoherent. Most of these treaties are based on the post-colonial model, heavily focused on investment protection and liberalization. Um, the broad and unpredictable interpretations of these treaties by, um, by arbitral tribunals have been widely criticized. But fortunately, thanks to the work of UNCTAD and many other organizations, um, an increasing number of newly concluded um, um, agreements have begun to incorporate uh, provisions with more considerations for sustainable development. Brazil offered one particular example of moving away from the traditional treaty models. In, 2015, in 2014, Brazil published a new bilateral treaty model called Cooperation and Facilitation of Investment Agreements. As you can see from some of the listed features here, well, instead of focusing on investment protection and liberalization, the new model focuses on facilitation and risk mitigation instead of subscribing to a particular standard in the treaty, the model establishes cooperation arrangements. So these parties could reach mutual understanding on practical issues, such as environmental, technical regulations, et cetera. Um, what's more, the, the model also requires that if investors are to enjoy the benefits of the treaty, then they would have to assume certain responsibilities listed in the treaty. This is a very important point because essentially the benefits of the treaty are only available to a type of investors that can actually contribute to the sustainable development of the whole state. And this is actually in line with what UNCTAD um, is recommending in the Global Action Menu for Investment Facilitation. First published in 2016, this guidance document reaffirms the fundamental importance of investment facilitation for growth and development. And noted that, uh, I'm quoting here, the effective investment facilitation efforts should support the mobilization and channeling of investment towards sustainable development. 
So in addition to UNCTAD, other international organizations have also been working on this issue. For example, um, the OECD has a policy framework for investment that contains a chapter on investment facilitation, which distinguishes investment facilitation with investment promotion. Because by definition, investment facilitation is more linked to liberalization as it is about making it easier for investors to establish or expand their investment. And recently, um, we've seen the OECD also started to explore options to establish a multilateral framework for investment facilitation. Um, G20, the group of 20 countries, uh, also worked on um, investment facilitation. They first mentioned investment facilitation during China's presidency in 2016. Um, the same year, the group adopted the G20 guiding principles for global investment, and investment facilitation was included as one of the uh, encouraging investment facilitation was included as one of the principles. In 2017, under Germany's presidency, um, a draft investment facilitation package was circulated and discussed among the members. And perhaps more in the news than what has brought most of the audience today um, is, is the ongoing discussion at the WTO. Uh, so um, we may recall that the only Singapore issue, one of the four Singapore issues that survived the July package after Cancun was the trade facilitation. After more than a decade of negotiation, the trade facilitation agreement was finally adopted um, in 2013 and went into effect um, last year, 2017. Seeing this as a very successful example that can be adapted and applied in investment facilitation, um, some WTO members proposed to explore the options for a multilateral instrument on investment facilitation. Now, other members um, have been hesitant to start negotiating those new, new issues as the July package um, in 2004 clearly prioritized the need to conclude a Doha round before, um, before moving on to new issues been receiving a warning from Martin saying I need to wrap up. So I'll, I'll wrap up quickly. Um, so during the Buenos Aires ministerial last year, there are 42 members, uh, 70 if you count individual EU member states, uh, issued a joint statement calling for structured discussion with aim of developing a multilateral framework on investment facilitation. And since March um, 2017, um, uh, there have been at least six proposals submitted to WTO by members. Now, Michelle will go into details of some of these proposals in a minute, but here is a snapshot of some of the elements covered in those proposals. We have to note here that most of the proposals are very preliminary, preliminary uh, because many were submitted as possible elements um, to be included in a possible future instrument. Nevertheless, it is uh, still um, interesting to see that except for the last two proposals, none of those offered a clear definition of investment facilitation. And most of the proposals still focus predominantly on the obligation of host states and was written what raised concerns on the um, actual application due to their broad and vague coverage of measures. Um, in fact, whether there is a discussion at WTO or UNCTAD or OECD or any other fora, when we look at the content of discussions, a few elements repeatedly jumped out to our attention. For example, um, they all mention regulatory transparency and predictability. They all mention streamlining administrative process. These processes have strong links to investment protection and liberalization. 
Perhaps for this reason and to preempt failures of the past, the joint ministerial de declaration at the WTO clearly said that the discussion at the WTO shall not address market access, investment protection, and ISDS. Now, whether it'll be possible to cover the issue of investment facilitation without addressing those issues will remain an open question. Because if we look at bilateral investment treaties and the cases that arose before those, um, we will quickly see that many of the traditional investment protection clauses, for example, national treatment, most favored nation treatment, fair equitable treatments, prohibitions on arbitrary and discriminatory measures, these were all designed and had been interpreted to ensure regulatory predictability and transparency. And tribunals have in many cases specifically held that a high standard of transparency and predictability are already embedded in those commitments. Similarly, when we're talking about streamlining and, and speeding up admission procedures, um, these um, are these really distinguishable from liberalization of market access? At least not from the investment treaty cases that we have seen in the past. But ultimately, the discussion about investment facilitation should focus on how processes can be designed so as to serve and advance sustainable development and sustainable development goals. All countries, especially in the developing world, need investment to achieve sustainable development. The question is where and how sustainable development can best be integrated in the investment processes and what can be done through international processes. What are some key considerations to go through from a sustainable, sustainable development perspective when entering into discussions? Um, so now I will invite my co-panelists to share their studies and views on these questions. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you, Martin and IISD for such a moving opportunity. Good morning to all from Brazil. Uh, after Joe's background information, um, I noticed that uh, we have some small overlaps, overlap, sorry for that. But as Marty has anticipated, my short intervention is so framed under four WH questions. The first one is what is investment facilitation? We can go ahead. Who is supporting it? And again, and where? And finally, why? Even for investment specialists, what exactly is investment facilitation is not an ordinary question. As Joe previously mentioned, some work has advanced a conceptual outline through bilateral and multilateral talks in the last two, three years. But the first consensus we can say has been driven around these three principles, transparency, predictability, and cooperation. However, as always, the devil is in the details. The misery is to be precise on what those principles result in terms of international commitments, as most of it is open to national bodies to decide upon their practices. Should that then consider curing practices and rules at the WTO or set new ones? How to avoid the discretion of national authorities? I guess that these are the core questions to the current debate. But in addition, and I say here opposition to that, another step has been taken to define what investment facilitation is not. The demoralization of investment regulation in the last decades has made countries to pull out of mainstream ideas of investor protection and their main system of protection that was the Investor State Dispute Settlement System, ISDS. Beyond that, multilateral discussion on investment facilitation have considered a fourth pillar of its conceptual frame, that is the incorporation of special and differential treatment, including here some capacity building to least developed countries. 
There are also other proposed raised at the multilateral level to include more detailed commitments on streamlining and speeding administrative procedures, the creation of single processing window, focal points, e-application, and so. So Joe's snapshot of the six main proposals at the WTO merits attention. The main outcome on definition up to now has been the work on mapping the rules, practices, and experiences on transparency in the WTO, other regional and bilateral agreements, as well as at the national level. And more recently, the focus has moved in the WTO towards streamlining administrative procedures. Other new agendas though may be raised in the future, such as bilateral thematic agendas, the definition of standards, but I see that all this would be long shot strategies. The second question is who is supporting this debate on investment facilitation? As Joe's mentioned, there are three countries that have been led the debate. Brazil, China, and Russia, as from the G20 first discussion in 2016, and the BRICS ministry statement in 2017. In addition to them, relevant groups have been organized, such as the MICTA, that includes Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and Australia, and the Friends of Investment Facilitation for Development representing 16 members as of December 2017. But such leadership, I see, is directly connected to the fora where the issue has been raised, which are the G20, the BRICS, a couple of regional initiatives, such as Mercosur, APEC, RCEP. And those include mostly developing countries from Latin America and Asia Pacific region. That's a uh, was a remarkable point that Roberto Azevedo has mentioned in last April, the importance of this movement being taken by developing countries and later supported by other developed countries. But this is a re relevant novelty in the investment debate at the international level. It should not be disregarded the role of OECD, UNCTAD, and WTO secretariats in preparing information material, systematization, and organization of the database to support current negotiations. Resistance is also there for different reasons. The most well known has been the resistance of India in last years and its reconsideration as from March this year as well as South Africa, India stands on the point that Joe's has raised that first Doha agenda should be closed and then new issues should be negotiated. But another type of resistance come from the US that is the main sponsor and user of the old BIT world. Or the resistance on that sense can be there as the BIT system is so spread out as we could see from that spaghetti bowl system. As mentioned, the content and the leaders of the debate is connected to the forum. So that's in the next slide, please. Where the topic has been addressed and designed. If OECD and UNCTAD had the role of pushing the investment debate, promoting analysis data and reports, Plurilateral negotiation for us, such as the G20 BRICS regional agreements, have promoted the multilateralization of the debate on investment and the legal framing for investment facilitation. Those movements favored these ambitious steps to formally multilateralize the negotiation at the WTO. So the joint ministry statement at MC11 with the support of around 70 WTO members was an important step that corresponds to more than 40% of the WTO membership. And regular meetings have taken place in the last month and the next is scheduled to July 23rd. Having the topic at the WTO 
has definitely favored the coordination of international organizations working in the field and the systematization of experiences, including those from the WTO itself, such as the trade facilitation ag agreement that has inspired some of the uh, legal frameworks. Where is this debate has not taken place? I guess that the main outsider has been the World Bank. Not only its exit agency, but the creditors agency inside the group. We should not forget UNCITRAL, where negotiations have focused on dispute settlement procedures. How will that all go along, if so? Last, but not least, is the question why are we talking about facilitation now? As Joe brilliantly described, there is a recognized failure of the old BIT exit system states reclaim their right to regulate and more control over disputes. And as Log will demonstrate, investors' claims are on this new side of the coin, asking for transparency and predictability. So when we think in the system, developing countries so found a place at the WTO to design a new proposal under the facilitation umbrella. But why not? Once described that this is not the moment, as is the case of India and South Africa, or not the right forum, such as it will argue the US. There is also the risk of bringing investment topic at the WTO, as there was a historical struggle by developing countries uh, resisting to that topic in the Uruguay round. And finally, we see limitations in the facilitation debate itself, and that I leave for our next discussion. I stop here and leave the floor. Thank you for your time. So I have been invited to uh, very briefly outline whether and to what extent there is in fact a business case to be made for spending bureaucratic resources and political capital on investment facilitation reforms, whether unilaterally or through uh, treaty instruments. And the reason uh, that is a relevant question is because in the case of traditional investment treaties, occasionally the business case has been, um, if not lacking, then at least quite limited. If we could have the next slide, please. In 2000, a survey of European multinationals asked about their awareness and relevance of investment treaties uh, only 10% of respondents uh, said they had working knowledge of the agreements. This included, uh, of course, both investors who uh, relied on the treaties for making their investments, but probably most of those 10% were investors that had relied on them directly and indirectly in the case of disputes. But notably, 50% of all respondents didn't even know that there was such a thing as an investment treaty. If you take the next slide, a decade after, uh, Jason Yaki, a colleague of ours, uh, uh, surveyed American multinationals. And in particular, he asked in-house legal counsel in American multinationals how familiar they were about investment treaties and how important they were to the typical FDI decision. And you will find the core result in this slide here. Very few senior executives involved in making investments were considered to be familiar with investment treaties, and even those that were hardly ever thought the treaties were important for their investment decisions. Can we take the next slide, please? Now, there's of course a large literature that most of you are aware of um, that assesses the question of whether and to what extent these agreements, invest, traditional investment treaties are important to promote uh, foreign investment. The results are uh, somewhat mixed. If we take the next slide and then the next slide again, just so we can go through this quickly. Uh, there, uh, the results are somewhat mixed, but I think um, gradually a consensus is emerging that while investment treaties are most definitely important for some investment decisions in some jurisdictions, in some sectors, they are very unlikely to have an impact on the vast majority of foreign investment decisions. And there's a lot of reasons for that. 
But one reason could be that traditional investment treaties may not, in fact, address some of the most binding constraints for foreign investors in the 21st century. So if you take the next slide. So uh, on the, no, go back one, yeah. Uh, what you see here in front of you is um, a survey that was published by the World Bank of a large group of multinationals. It was published a couple of months ago, and the survey was conducted in 2017. And so it's sort of interesting and it asks about a wide range of factors that is important for their investment decisions. And when you hone in on the relevance of what the World Bank calls investment climate factors, then some of the issues that are traditionally considered to be uh, investment facilitation issues uh, rank, not surprisingly, very highly. Uh, transparency and predictability in the conduct of public agencies is by far the most important factor amongst investment climate factors. Uh, and the third most important is the ease of obtaining government approvals to start a business and the ability to own all equity in the company. Now, as was also mentioned by the previous speakers, there is some uncertainty about what do we actually mean by investment facilitation, which in turn is important for the extent to which it overlaps with traditional investment protection measures, but also uh, liberalization or establishment measures. And um, a survey like this one, um, sort of models these uh, elements um, together. So it can be somewhat difficult to assess how important the others of the facilitation elements compared to the traditional protection and establishment uh, elements. So if we go to the next slide, uh, the World Bank asked in more detail on the most important factors when it came to ease of entry. And there, uh, the most important factor was a, a, a so squarely along the facilitation um, route. So the most important issue was the ability to quickly obtain investment approvals and permits to start a business. And the third most important was the ability to bring in expatriate staff and get visas and work permits. Um, market access and liberalization uh, measures of the ability to invest with majority ownership was also considered very important. In fact, it was the most important deal breaker if you couldn't have majority ownership. Um, but nevertheless, uh, some traditional facilitation issues, irrespective of, of, of establishment rules, were critically important. We take the next slide. Um, what the World Bank has also done is they've gone into in somewhat more detail looking at the sort of the binding constraints when it comes to different types of investment facilitation issues. And one is this issue about obtaining investment approvals and permits to start a business. And the waiting times vary across jurisdictions, of course. It's very quick here in the UK and the United States and elsewhere in many industrialized countries. But typically, on average, it takes about three months. And in some jurisdictions, particularly in, in, in some developing countries, it can take up to a year, uh, maybe even more. Uh, so you can imagine that to the extent that you have a reform package that identifies and addresses those constraints that could potentially actually have some tangible impact on investment flows, and perhaps even more so than traditional uh, investment protections. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lauge. Um, I would actually like to move straight to the um, questions and, and answers uh, part of our presentation. I had a couple of questions here and um, just a couple of questions to, to, tease, uh, to tease discussions here. Um, so the first would be, what are the advantages and disadvantages of multilateralizing discussions on investment facilitation? It's a point that uh, Joe in, in particular, but also Michelle has already touched on. And uh, a second tier question would be, uh, how can these discussions at several uh, forums internationally on investment facilitation be seized as an opportunity to foster, foster uh, foreign investment that effectively contributes to the achievement of uh, the sustainable development goals? So um, these are, are really just to, to tease uh, you to, to think of, of other questions. You can raise them by chat, um, just hovering your um, the the bottom 
part of your app. It really should vary depending on the app that you're using. But if you hover there, you should be able to see the, the chat facility. Uh, or you can also raise uh, your hand and then enter your, um, or we will un unmute, unmute you and uh, uh, ask you to, uh, to, to make your question, to, to speak your question to, to all participants. There's also a Q&A uh, button at the, at the bottom uh, bar. And we actually already have um, a question from, uh, Samuel Trujillo, even though the purpose of facilitation is in theory not investor protection and ISDS, could there be consequences in that field? In particular, how would a relationship between IIAs, invest, international investment agreements, and a treaty in this area look like taking into account these two points? Article 31.3 of the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties, which mandates that related international obligations, such as those related to predictability, be taken together with the context when interpreting a treaty, for example, IFET. And then two, the other provision clause uh, most IIAs have, which in general says something like, if the legislation of either state or international obligations existing at present, at present or established hereafter between the states in addition to this treaty contain any provision uh, entirely, entirely invest, investments to a treatment more favorable than what is provided by this treaty, such provisions shall prevail over this treaty to the extent that they are more favorable. So um, Joe and Michelle and Lauge, any, any takers on this first question posed by uh, Samuel? Hi, here is Michelle. I can go ahead with Samuel Trujillo just exploring the consequences. I think that this is a really hard point that has been raised. And uh, you have, uh, and Joe has mentioned the idea of the relationship with this fair and equitable treatment idea and uh, how that will deal with the notion of predictability uh, and transparency. Um, that, yes, I think that that all will depend on the design of this new um, rules and WTO and how much the members are open to engaged in this discussion uh, in linking to the old system as well as to keep the new roles a part of what has been negotiated in the past. And uh, if we take a look also in the proposals uh, by the members, we can see that Russia is a member that has mentioned that uh, maybe uh, we could uh, uh, take into account future disciplines on market access and definitely for me that will deal with investor protection and the treatment and that can include the, the bunch of experience in the past in what concerns and so uh, I see that the types of clauses that can really connect to the those system is the market access and treatments, and also the rules on screening that will deal directly uh, with um, investors' rights. And um, this is a proposal from China that is very concerned about that. On ISDS, um, we also can see uh, the risk of uh, having or not a dispute prevention or including the dispute settlement in the WTO, and uh, if that would be alternative or supplementary systems, uh, and that has been the, 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 the hard part of the system today is really, even though we, we don't have those provisions in the agreements, we can see like uh, the tobacco case going to more than one uh, dispute settlement system. So how to do that uh, or to af uh, avoid that in the future? Again, that will depend on the design of the agreement at the WTO level. 
Uh, but that will also probably, uh, my last point here is that it can also uh, may uh, provoke the members, the WTO members, since uh, new roles in the WTO be settled, uh, to go back to their bilateral investment treaties and to look uh, what they should keep or not, and how those systems should be connect connected or not. That's my take. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, would anyone else like to, to respond to the question posed by Sam or maybe react to um, Michelle's comment? If not, uh, we have another question here from an anonymous attendee who asked, how do you see investment facilitation actions by governments different from implementation of domestic regulation provisions, such as the one in GATS? Would any of our, uh, would Logda maybe uh, want to tackle this? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, um, I, I would love to, it's a little bit unclear to me what's meant. Maybe the anonymous attendee could, could clarify, uh, and then we can move on to a, to, a, to, a, to a separate question. Would that be okay, Martin? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we're, Several questions are popping up here, so maybe I'll just uh, read the next one, uh, so we can we can try to um, condense them, lump them together. Uh, there's also a question from Pedro Cavalcanti, who had already asked in the in the general chat here. Uh, are you aware of the uh, Are you aware of the Brazilian possible elements document for an investment facilitation agreement? Could you please comment on that proposal? If I, if I may, just to begin with, and then maybe uh, Michelle can follow up on the actual proposal. I think the Brazilian experience is uh, uh, interesting for other reasons, namely um, what made the Brazilian government initiate uh, an emphasis on investment facilitation in the first place in its recent uh, agreements and its proposals at the WHO. And remarkably, uh, it has been very, very rare in the history of the investment machine for governments, whether in developed or developing countries, to conduct a systematic survey of their own investors' perceptions of what are the most binding constraints facing them abroad and how could governments best address those constraints in international agreements before starting to initiate uh, investment treaties. Brazil was different, so after there was a request by Brazilian companies to initiate an investment treaty program uh, a couple of years ago, the Brazilian government went and asked Brazilian firms themselves, what is it you would want us to include in such agreements? And uh, uh, Felipe can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the feedback from Brazilian firms implied that many of the core protections in traditional investment treaties were not very high on their priority list, but rather it was the everyday, mundane, concrete barriers on the ground that uh, is included in, Brazil, in, in Brazil's uh, recent proposal on issues such as uh, streamlining administrative procedures and so forth. And just to go back to my presentation, I think that's a it's an interesting and surprisingly novel way of, of addressing its investment policy. Um, one would have thought traditionally that states would very carefully listen to their business community before going and negotiating investment agreements. That has traditionally not been the case, but Brazil has been different. And that, to me at least, explains partly why their, why their model looks uh, so different than, than traditional investment treaties. And as for the uh, uh, model itself, uh, maybe Michelle would uh, uh, would be able to comment on that or Gio. Yes, I, I guess that I'm on the same page as Joe on the sense that um, th there are topics and um, I see topics of the Brazilian model that are missing in the Brazilian proposal and I think that they were really sensitive for developing countries and would be 
a new frame for the debate on investment, such as the thematic agenda. I think that was very interesting. And then I would maybe provoke uh, an idea that would be, why not having maybe a broad framework as Brazil has proposed in the WTO, working on that, but at the same time allowing for other bilateral negotiations inside the structure of the WTO, looking for the needs of developing countries in their bilateral relations. Because as we see, uh, the point for developing countries, it's not only in hosting foreign direct investment or in receiving more greenfield maybe investment, but also the idea of how to promote their outward investment. And that deals with, with very, very uh, daily topics such as having direct flights from one country to another or a, uh, facilitating the visa procedures. That's, uh, that's what uh, maybe uh, as law has pointed us, uh, investors are claiming for. And I think that th this is where the, there is the new real need for developing countries. Um, my, my, my second comment on the case of the Brazilian framework, uh, and there, uh, I think that there is a more uh, lengthy discussion is about um, how far the, dis the WTO dispute settlement system can go. In the framework that I've had, I received it, it's not clear enough to me. And uh, all the connections that can be made in the future is not yet clear in that framework to me. And uh, there is a risk there, as we, we all know, and even from the side of Brazil that decided not to uh, have an ISDS and to maybe uh, decide for a state to state arbitration in its bilateral agreements, how will that coordinate with the WTO system? Uh, I think that there are, uh, these are the issues that pop up to me uh, concerning the dispute settlement that is not yet clear. Maybe we, you can help us clarifying what is there. I think it would be great. Thank you, Michelle. So there are questions now on uh, the Brazilian model and also on dispute settlement. And there are several other questions that uh, participants are asking here. But first, I would like to, to give an opportunity to Felipe Hees, who has raised his hand and has a comment uh, on a question that was raised before. Maybe he can also uh, um, weigh in, in in this discussion on the Brazilian model and the Brazilian approach uh, at the WTO. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that a number of issues that came now with the, the, the comments and questions, and I think uh, uh, what I would like to say is that actually it's important to focus on the nature of investment facilitation, at least from a Brazilian perspective. We are really concentrating on procedural issues and, and, and the issue of the negative definition of investment facilitation, emphasizing that actually investment protection, ISDS, is out of the scope of what we understand to be investment facilitation is really critical. And, and, and the point that Joe made is it, that's, that's, uh, that connects directly to actually the feedback that we got from our, our investors going abroad that before having something to protect you, you have to start doing business in the country in order to think about next steps. And actually, this is where our, our approach uh, comes in. We, we are trying to, to simplify, to facilitate navigating red tape, eliminating red tape to enter, to, to, to really to, to seize a business opportunity before thinking of anything else. And I think that this is, uh, this is the this main difference is what makes investment facilitation a different issue if you compare to investment as a Singapore issue. And, and that's why we are not, uh, investment facilitation, it's not it's different from the BIT, the scope of BITs. Then you are looking straight into really uh, policy, uh, ensuring the right of investors. And that's not what we are saying in investment facilitation. So this is one thing that it's, it should not be underestimated because this is, this is it's a core, a core uh, uh, change of, of, of paradigm of what we're talking. 
With regard to uh, one thing that Michelle mentioned, and I think it's a very interesting one, one of the challenges that we had when uh, drafting the Brazilian proposal to be submitted to the WTO was exactly to try to keep this, the thematic agenda that you can have on a bilateral basis. And actually it's not very easy how you translate something that is very peculiar to a bilateral agreement into something that is meant to be multilateral. And the, the best answer that we got is in paragraph 11 of article 19 of our proposal. The suggestion that we are making that could be what we believe might be the closest uh, solution to the thematic agenda is to ensure that you can have open-ended working groups that would discuss issues of interest on, of only a subset of members. If, if a number of members decide that there is an issue of interest, they, a, a working group can be created. There is no need for you to, to have consensus or 164 members agreeing on that. You can have different working groups discussing issues of interest of a limited number of, 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 of countries. So this is not exactly the same, but this is the best sort of multilateral equivalent that we found to uh, the thematic uh, uh, agendas that we have in the bilateral ones. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felipe. I think this goes also to, to my question of about the uh, advantages and disadvantages or uh, risks and challenges also of multilateralizing the discussions on investment facilitation. We um, know that, for example, in the Brazilian case, uh, a consultation was made in the private sector in Brazil um, in the lines of what Lauge presented in, in his presentation to understand uh, what the interest of uh, the private sector in Brazil would be. And this is what has uh, been used, uh, as far as I understand, by Brazil to negotiate its treaties with its partners. But taking that to the multilateral level, as Felipe has just uh, uh, shared with us uh, his experience is would be would be a, a different uh, a different challenge uh, would pose more risks would also uh, uh, make it more uh, difficult to to um, actually define the contents of these agendas for cooperation and, and facilitation um, in in a, a, in a multilateral setting but i would i would like to go back to uh, a question asked by shamali we singe i'm sorry if i mispronounced your name um she asks since there are so many bits signed between countries which include isds is it necessary investment in investor state dispute settlement is it necessary to include dispute settlement chapters in an investment facilitation agreement can we consider this as an mou between two country two countries um, uh, would anyone uh, like to, to elaborate on this or, or ask further questions on this? Yeah, I can uh, try to answer this, if I may. Um, yeah, I, I think this question, Shmali's question, is actually somehow related to Sam's question asked earlier. Uh, uh, I, I see that I, I see this is actually um, two sides of the coin um, because basically Sam was asking what are the impact of a future um, investment facilitation agreement or instrument have given the current. Um, existing IAAs and the, the, the interpretation of existing IAAs and then the umbrella clauses and IAAs. And Shamali is asking how the current BIT um, regime would somehow include the future instruments um, and, and work together. Um, and I, I, I think this um, relates to my earlier comments that um, no, uh, also, I would like to thank um, uh, Philip's intervention that whether this is a question on the nature or a question on a procedure, if we look from a um, sustainable development lens, if we look this whole discussion through the lens of a sustainable development, um, and we have, look, we have to look from the bigger picture that given the situation we're in right now, given the existing um, um, fragmented um, investment treaty network we have right now, 
any instrument that we enter um, would have some consequences um, on both sides. And uh, the thing is that no matter how well we, um, um, it, so, so if, if the investment facilitation instrument, if it is not defined well, if it's not um, clearly limit um, its um, um, coverage, then as Sam pointed out in his question, um, these obligations can be well imported um, um, to the way, to, to the extent that not intended by uh, the parties who are signing up to the investment facilitation agreements. And these in, uh, obligations will be imported to the investment treaty arena and facing um, investor state dispute settlement. And this will be the same um, consequence that Sh Shamali also referred to. Um, so, so really, I, I think the question comes down to how to make sure the investment facilitation instrument or this framework that we're discussing right now really focus on the issue, as mentioned in Laugate's presentation, focus on the issue that really promoting sustainable development without any um, like unintended um, consequences um, given the, the, the existing investment framework we already have today. Um, and the second thing is whether we need to attach it um, or whether it should be discussed um, in an environment that um, will attach to a disciplinary actions with uh, binding commitments in that sense. So um, yeah, that's my two cents. I'm not sure if I make myself clear. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I would like to, to go back to a question here by, um, by Mavluda. Sator Satorova, uh, who asks um, for, to Michelle uh, if he understood correctly, the World Bank has been an outsider to the emerging investment facilitation agenda. Uh, in what sense? I thought the World Bank was behind some of the recent reforms on the investment facilitation front in developing countries. Uh, and then the same question regarding the United States approach. Did I understand you correctly that the United States have shown some resistance to investment facilitation? Is that only within the frame of discussions at the WTO or is there evidence that the US is being opposed to investment facilitation at a bilateral level as well? So Michelle, would you like to, uh, to reply to that? Sure, glad to do it. Uh, well, thanks for uh, let me clarify that. I my point was that you're right that World Bank has probably is the most traditional agency trying to promote this uh, doing business and like uh, 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 the good uh, rule of law in uh, developing countries and uh, in promoting domestic reform on that sense. And there I think we have a work is really to clarify to what extent we are talking about the same things. I suspect we are, it's not exactly, we, we, we could maybe uh, elaborate more on that, but I wouldn't say that investment facilitation is exactly like doing business regulation. Uh, there is a, an important role of the state there, this notion of right to regulate, so other spheres of regulation that would be involved. Uh, and, um, but my, my, my point was that the World Bank was outside of the, the discussions in the WTO. And uh, if I know that is a, a dangerous game that probably invest in developing countries are trying to skip off, uh, but at the same time, when we try to figure out about uh, uh, sustainable um, uh, investments and clauses and tools that could promote that, the creditors and agency are very important players. 
so in that sense, I think that we should explore uh, maybe uh, their role on that. Um, about the U.S. position, uh, it's a resistance that probably is not really uh, uh, so formally uh, registered in the WTO level, in the meeting, minutes of the meeting and so, but it's really not a member that has engaged in the negotiation and in the discussions. And, it's a missing, an important missing part, a member, uh, and this is relevant. Uh, I wouldn't say so that it, if they are uh, resistant to investment facilitation at the bilateral level, because it all depends on what you mean by investment facilitation, your idea and uh, your notion for sure that many of the clauses that we already have in the BITs, especially the new versions, uh, uh, would include certain uh, investment facilitation uh, clauses. Uh, but it's true that uh, this is not the most important point for US in investment negotiations. I think that I'll, 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 uh, the point is there. For US is not as relevant as a regulation of in, in, for invest, investment today. And uh, Probably also uh, we'll see uh, as for the US, another resistance in thinking if we think about the screening process that have taken place uh, in the country, especially uh, in what concerns Chinese investments. So I'm not sure if the US would be open, especially at this moment to discuss that. Thank you very much, Michelle, for addressing that and, and clarifying the points. Uh, we're running out of time, but I would like to give Joe an opportunity to reply to the question posed by the anonymous attendee who clarified his or her question. So, Joe, would you like to address that? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, so, if I understand correctly, you're asking if there's overlapping between the current investment facilitation discussions and then the existing um, commitments that uh, members entered into in the GATS. Um, so to answer that twofold, um, first of all, um, yes, there's some investment issues covered in GATS, the, the General Agreement on Trainer Services, but uh, um, it's only very limited because the GATS mostly deals with traded services and the part of the investment covered in GATS is basically just mode three um, of the traded services, which is the uh, commercial establishment. Uh, so that's part of the, the FDI. Um, so that only covers part of the investment measures and activities we're talking about. Um, the, the other perspective is that um, yes, tra transparency and predictability of regulations, uh, this is part of the discussion under the current investment facilitation, um, and some of it are also covered um, in the GATS, but in terms of this, this content, um, investment, the current investment facilitation discussions covers much more than just um, transparency and, and, and predictability. There are other areas of the, uh, the, the proposals that um, some other elements that we haven't been able to cover today include, for example, institutional arrangements, um, cooperation, uh, multilateral cooperation, um, and um, uh, for example, uh, monitoring systems, uh, so, so all these are not yet um, covered under uh, the GATS, even if for, for only the mode three of the services, that part. So yes, there definitely there is an overlap of, of some of the discussions, just the same as the overlap between the, the, the investment treaty framework uh, that we have today with the discussion of the investment facilitation 
um, but these are still um, they are still having different um, uh, contents um, and elements. So again, I, I think it is really important to make sure that to delineate um, the discussions. What when we talk about investment facilitations, what do we really talk about, or what do we really mean? So if we we really need to make that clear. Um, and make sure that the, the discussion on investment facilitation really contributing and advancing sustainable development. Yeah, that's just my attempt. Hope, uh, hope that's okay. Thank you, Joe. So, um, because we've unfortunately reached the, the end of our allotted time, um, I'm sure discussions could go on and um, many other interesting questions questions could be asked and discussed, but at the same time, despite the technical issues we've had, I think uh, we can safely conclude that we've had a very productive discussion today with uh, several uh, invaluable inputs and questions from participants. So I would like to thank you all of, uh, thank all of your, um, thank you all for your contributions, for joining us and participating actively. Also very, um, Special thanks to our experts who participated today, Michelle, Lauge, Joe, thank you very much for your presentations and your insight. Um, finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues at IISD, our group director, Nelly Bernasconi, who helped uh, structure this uh, webinar, along with my colleagues, uh, Joelle Deschambeau and Stacy Corneau, who are based in Ottawa and helped us also uh, set up the webinar. We will be circulating um, well, we have already circulated the background paper prepared by Joe, but we will also uh, send you the, the presentations that were made today, the PowerPoint presentations. Um, and of course, um, we will keep you posted on future webinars on this uh, ISD webinar series on investment law and policy. Um, thank you very much to all, and I hope you have a, a great rest of your day wherever you are. Thank you.